<clears throat> yeah, eh, greetings, everybody. Thank you for tuning in this evening. Um, I want to thank you all again, all our beautiful, wonderful panelists that are joining us here tonight and welcoming our third panel. <laughs> Um, before we start, I want us all to please acknowledge that wherever you are tuning in from within Turtle Island, that you are on native land, our ancestors pre-exist so-called America. Thank you. <clears throat> so with that, let's go ahead and kick us off on our teaching series. I will go ahead and introduce myself and our panelists, and then we'll jump into our questions. <clears throat> this evening, um, Again, we have some great panelists, and um, my name is Talia Boyd. I'm the Cultural Landscapes Program Manager for the Grand Canyon Trust. And um, I'm uh, Thank you, relatives, all for tuning in and for supporting um, these amazing panelists throughout this series. And uh, we're talking about some really important issues um, that affect Indian country. And um, these are these are hard questions that we're, we ask our panelists, um, and you know these it gets emotional because these are very hard issues that hit very close to home, and of course there's um, deep trauma that exists still because of the land loss of our homelands, and so these are again hard issues for us native peoples to discuss, but also very necessary and very critical, and so that's why we're here tonight. And um, thank you all again for joining us. I want to go ahead and introduce our panelists. <clears throat> this evening we have Miss Amy Wan. She is from Tohono O'odham Nation, which shares 75 miles of international border with the U.S.-Mexico uh, border. She is the founder of the Tohono O'odham Hamajkam Rights Network, uh, and currently works for the International Indian Treaty Council as the Arizona Community and Tribal Liaison. Thank you so much for being here, Sister Amy. <clears throat> Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Vanessa Noisy. Vanessa is a loving mother of four daughters and a community organizer. Vanessa holds positions including the co-chair of BAS Sacred Organization, member of the Mountain of Spirit Runners, founding member and youth advisor of Native Youth Unite, member of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, and an, organizer mem an organizing member of Apache Stronghold. She protects the, the ancestral home and sacred places of her tribe and the San Carlos Apache tribe. Thank you for joining us, Vanessa. <clears throat> Next, I'd like to welcome Ms. Terry Kiana. Teresita Kiana, also known as Terry. She is an advocate and dedicated volunteer to supporting Navajo elders over 20 years. She currently serves as the liaison for the Redwater Pond Road Community Association, where she manages community improvement projects such as respiratory for uranium waste, um, from uranium waste that has caused chronic health issues in her community. Terry received a certificate in automotive technology from the University of New Mexico and uh, geospatial information technology certification from um, SIPI, the Southwest Indian Polytech Institute. Thank you for joining us, Terry. Again, we have an amazing panel this evening. <clears throat> and um, in this session, we will hear from our wonderful native leaders about community organizing um, from their tribal homelands and uh, exercising native sovereignty and, and how to protect their homelands. Um, the panelists will discuss how tribal consultation did or did not play out in those instances of their organizing, and they will speak to their experiences on fighting on behalf of their community's rights to be recognized. So thank you all again for tuning in, and um, I want to go ahead and kick us off on our questions. Uh, we have a lot to cover, and we, we are condensing a lot of information in a very short amount of time, and so... Um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So I'm gonna ask Amy to go ahead and kick us off with the first question. Please explain, Amy, where Tohono O'odham homelands are and how O'odham have been impacted by the so-called U.S.-Mexico border. Okay. Well, it's good evening, everyone. I'm Amy Wan, the nation. And Yakak Jinawaska, uh, Yakak Jinawaska, Jichik, Mary, 
um, Melissa Miles Butt, Joe Daniel Wan Butt, and Yehul Virginia Bob of Chichigig, Mary Elizabeth McGill Butt, Joe Lawrence McGill Butt, um, and your Wilmacum on um, New A Wilmacum. So uh, good evening, everyone. I'm really um, honored to be here to share and also to um, just be amongst um, strong, strong women who are doing um, good work in their communities. It's always an honor to, to share this space. And so <clears throat> I'm going to um, share uh, some photos, a presentation to give everyone um, a visualization of what is happening or what has been happening and what is currently happening out in um, autumn, Hajuriga and autumn lands. And so um, this uh, first photo is just a photo of our, our secret, um, one of our most secret mountains, Walkiwak, also known as Bobby Kirby Peak. Um, and then we can go to the next slide. So since we are, you know, way down south, um, literally on the border, divided by the border, I'm going to share some um, maps just to give you context of where we're at. So traditionally, autumn um, lands spanned um, south to Hermosillo, Mexico, um, north to um, what is now the Phoenix Scottsdale area, um, east to the San Pedro River, um, east of Tucson, and west to the Sea of Cortez right there and in this map, um, the orange space is the traditional autumn territory and then in the red is um, what lands we occupy currently as an established um, reservation or the res, the Thonautam Nation. And then we um, share 75 miles of international border with Mexico and um, the US. And we say it like that because it's not our border. Um, we didn't we didn't put it up, <laughs> so we can go to the next slide. And also, um, if anyone has any questions, uh, and, and this uh, map just to give you a context of of where we're at again um, in some areas, how close we are to Tucson. We're about sixty five miles west of Tucson, and about two hundred miles um, south of Phoenix, Arizona. And I also. Um, like this map because it also also shows um, how we are surrounded by um, national parks. And so to the west, Oregon Pipe National uh, Monument Park, uh, Cabeza Prieta National Wildlife uh, Range, and then um, it's not in here, but uh, to the east of us, also the um, Buenos Aires um, National uh, Park, and then also the Saguaro National Park, um, which is a little bit more, um, North, northwest to us. So we're surrounded by these areas um, that have um, impacted and, and do um, occupy traditional autumn lands and have also displaced autumn um, when they were established. Next slide. <clears throat> and this is the current res. Um, the Don Autumn Nation is broken up into um, 11 districts, um, and within each of those districts are um, several communities, and then we're also spread out through different counties, Maricopa County, Pinal County, uh, Pima County, and then um, in this map, it doesn't show that the lands expand into Mexico, but um, or what is now Mexico, but uh, just south of the line, we also have um, nine traditional autumn communities that still um, exist um, to the south of what is now the U.S.-Mexico border. Next slide. So um, drawing the line through Autumn Jewett, you know, we weren't um, consulted when the border was, was drawn. Um, we are definitely impacted, we're impacted and continue to be in, impacted by um, the, the border as it is now. I would say not so much in the past, you know, there wasn't, um, so much of a, a fence or a line, but throughout the years, there's been different types of fencing that have gone up. And when I was growing up, uh, my my grandfather, my dad's father, um, my wasp, he's from a community called Newfields, and that's the last community on the U.S.-Mexico border. So I actually grew up um, going back and forth across the line, but 
um, when I was small, you know, cruising in the back of my grandpa's pickup truck, I didn't realize that we were crossing the border. I didn't realize that we were going between two countries. I just knew that I was out with my grandpa checking on his cattle um, during uh, uh, and our also's. Uh, we would, you know, visit cemeteries to take care of the graves from our, our families and visit family. And so crossing the border <clears throat> was a normal thing for me and for us. And it's also um, a big part of my family and our, our um, people's history. And I just wanted to acknowledge, um, uh, you know, the elders, um, uh, generations before me and others who have continued to resist um, um, the U.S.-Mexico border and just the impacts that it has on us. And this is a picture that um, is taken in the community of Arichu or Manager's Dam. And this is um, Ophelia Rivas, who's a longtime um, resistor of, of occupation um, there in her community. And it varies throughout the line um, how these communities are impacted. And so that where she's standing used to be a traditional crossing for them. And that's a lot closer to Sonoita or Luke, the Lukeville um, port of entry. Uh, next. <clears throat> so this is a, a personal reflection of my family. This is at the San Miguel Gate, which is a, a bit more east and it's another traditional crossing um, where Autumn would cross back and forth from um, um, our families and the communities in, in Mexico into the U.S. or onto the onto the Donatha Nation now. And this is, uh, this picture was taken at the San Miguel Gate <clears throat> um, where uh, it used to be a place where we would gather and where we would trade. Um, my grandma would talk about uh, buying coffee and buying um, different things when people would gather there. And up until about, I would say maybe 10 years ago, we could still buy things there. Um, and you can see that the people used to, to gather and that man on the horse, that's my um, late grandfather, Alex uh, Juan. And so this brings back a lot of memories of how it used to be. You know, we hear stories about how the border is a dangerous place and there's so much, you know, happening down here, but it wasn't always like that. It was um, a place where people would meet and to gather. So I just wanted to share that for context. Next. This is the same place now. This is, again, the San Miguel Gate. And this is actually um, looking uh, from the Mexico side into the U.S. side. Um, this is a, a barrier that was put up a couple of years ago, um, actually from the Mexico side. And um, <clears throat> uh, you can see that this sign here um, is in English, Spanish, and all of them. Um, and so this crossing was actually closed and locked. And so, um, and that's continued to happen over um, the different areas that we would cross. And so now it becomes even more difficult for both um, for Autumn on the U.S. side and Autumn in the Mexico side to do what we need to do, um, whether that's to go get groceries, to go to the hospital, to go to school. Um, there's kids that would um, meet their buses near the gate um, to go to school, um, but that became a lot more difficult to do now. Can you go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> So this is where we have to go through now. And I don't know if you if you noticed um, the mountain in the background, that's what you would, that's the picture of the mountain that I showed in the beginning and is is um, in the center of of um, um, the nation. And so it kind of gives like a context. And this is looking um, from Mexico coming back into the US. And this is the Sassabee port of entry. This is the most Eastern port of entry that we have to go through now. And so the um, previous picture um, to get to the villages from that area took about 20 minutes. And now um, that those areas are closed, we have to travel all the way around through these um, official port of entries. And it takes about two hours now. Um, and these are the places that people have to go to take um, things to their families, you know, things that they might need. Um, especially food, especially groceries and, and um, things that people need to take care of themselves. 
And part of the consultation with this is that we do have to now, um, it, it is a process in consulting with the Department of Homeland Security, with the United States Border Patrol, United States Customs. We currently can use our tribal IDs as our passports and being able to cross the border um, without a U.S. passport. And those are some things that the tribe has been able to negotiate throughout the years. Um, but that is also something that's changing um, with the enhanced tribal IDs that a lot of other tribes have um, began, begun to use, like, uh, for instance, the Pascuyaki tribe. And uh, mainly it's just a way to make it easier for us to travel back and forth. Um, because when we use our tribal IDs now, they have to like manually enter our information. <clears throat> and um, for some people, including myself, I like to exercise our sovereignty and those agreements by utilizing my tribal ID. Um, and sometimes we get hassled for it, but you know, those are agreements that we've made and they need to be upheld. And um, a lot of times you'll notice that a lot of the agents um, are, are um, kind of like recycled through the different units throughout the country. And so it's not always the same people that stay in an area too long. So we're always having to educate agents about our rights to cross freely and to cross back and forth across the border. So it's just a little taste of what we have to do um, now um, and how that changed from being able to cross on our own lands and to cross freely um, to now um, being able or have, having to go through a process like this. So next slide. And um, <clears throat> the, the, the wall um, certainly has changed a lot of things as well. Um, growing up, it was just the three, you know, bar three line barbed wire fence for me and a cattle guard. And like I said, I didn't realize when I was, um, you know, six, seven, eight years old that I was crossing um, an international line. Um, but uh, for the past couple of years, I'm sure everyone's heard about the construction of the border wall um, down south. And just to clarify that the border wall as it exists now, and as you see it in the picture, um, it's not like that on the Dawn of the Nation, but it is um, it is erected on both sides of us. And so this is a part of the wall that was going up um, to the west of us, um, heading towards Yuma. And um, I shared this picture because it's, when you see it, um, it's very surreal um, to know that just last year um, and the year before it was it was an open space and there was uh, vehicle barriers or there was an established um, barrier but now we have that still um, wall there and it is completed um, from the um, Lukeville port of entry towards towards Yuma and there's a lot of different things that have come up um, especially um, the uncovering of uh, ancestral remains and just ancestral sites and sacred sites um, during the construction. And one of the most impacted areas has been Arawaipia or Kipipikipo Springs. Go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so this is Arawaipia or Kipipikipo Springs. And this is located in what is now the Oregon Pipe National Monument Park. Um, and it is also um, an area that has been taken care of by the Hiachir Otham, which are another um, band of Otham, if you will, um, that have historically occupied that area. But they um, were displaced um, with the establishment of the park, as well as the, um, the uh, bombing ranges that, are, um, that exist now in the area around Ajo, Arizona. And so the spring is not very far it's only a couple of feet from the border wall so it was impacted by uh, border construction um, and it's home to also some rare and endangered species um, the sonoran mud turtle um, snails that are about the size of a, a poppy seed and just a whole bunch of wildlife that have um, depended on and, and have um, survived through this water source for thousands and thousands of years. It truly is an oasis. 
And one of the things that um, has happened during the construction with the movement of, you know, such heavy materials and um, trucks and just, you know, the construction that happened in such a um, vast amount of time is that there's a, currently a leak happening um, in the spring that they're looking to repair. Um, the, and just also, you know, the drought that we experienced last year and the year before, um, it, it was close to drying up. And so there's always an, a watchful eye on that area <clears throat> and making sure that it's protected and making sure that it's maintained for um, as a life source. Next slide, please. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, a picture that we took um, in January of um, 2020. And when we had heard about, or when we um, uh, knew that the border wall construction was gonna happen, we had ceremonies down there for both um, uh, them in Mexico and them in the U.S. And um, we took this picture and I'm glad that we did because it memorializes that time and how we were able to connect with each other across the line um, because it doesn't look like that anymore. Um, the wall is there and the spring is just on the other side of that tree line. And so <clears throat> that's, that, that's just a, a small um, example of one of of how we're impacted in many of the areas along um, the U.S.-Mexico border where we are. And um, I, I'm short on time, but I'm going to, uh, I have a, more to share as we go through the questions. And um, just thank you for um, allowing me to share this part of um, autumn land. So that's what it looks like now. Yeah. Thank you so much, Amy. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful homelands. Um, I do have a, a follow-up question to that. Um, I know there's surveillance that occurs there. Is that 24-hour surveillance? Yeah. And are there any laws that protect y'all from from that? I, I, I guess not, right? If it's 24 hours, I'm just wondering. Yeah, so part of all of that too is um, we do have, um, uh, they actually just directed some some surveillance towers that are are actually new technology out of um, Israel, um, Elbit systems, and it's it's pretty intrusive, um, and it's not just on the border; it's in our communities too. There's mountaintop surveillance, there's checkpoints, um, and just different types of surveillance, and that doesn't include just agents that are um, in and around the nation, you know, watching people and watching what's watching people, basically. Um, <clears throat> there aren't any laws per se that protect our privacy, mostly from what I've seen and experienced is that it takes us to assert that right and to say something, um, especially to protect areas that are sensitive and sacred in different communities. Um, but that is something that I see and I envision that the Donald Nation does um, and should um, consider creating our own border policies because we don't right now we just established um, we just established agreements with um, U.S. Border Patrol and you know coordinate through different grants and things like that but as far as something that protects us that comes from us that's something that's not in place right now so that's um, something that I want to work on um, going forward into the future because we need it there's no, there's no place <clears throat> that holds um, the, the United States Border Patrol accountable for their actions. Um, there is a, a liaison, there's a place to um, submit complaints, but there's not really any feedback or any consequence. And there's different instances that have happened throughout the years of um, agents um, harming community members, but you know, nothing really came out of that. So. It is sad, but <clears throat> we've come a long way. And for myself um, and others who have grown up in these times of watching these changes happen in our community, this is why we do the work that we do. So, <clears throat> well, we'll, we'll see, you know, it is a living history and like in real time, you know, we're experiencing something that we've never experienced before. So that's... <laughs> it's a lot it's a lot to share and it, is. it is heavy you know like you mentioned but there's also like that fire to protect the people is what keeps us going 
Yeah, absolutely. And it is about, you know, practicing our tribal sovereignty and, and asserting our demands when it comes to these things, right? And, and really um, asking all agencies to be accountable and transparent in all of these um, situations, right? And that includes our own tribal governments and own tribal agencies. And so exactly. that's, that's important. And thank you for highlighting that. Um, thank you. Yeah, I w there's a quick question. So I want to go ahead and try to uh, see if we can answer it. I expect the Tohono O'odham Nation requested consultation when the law was coming. What was the response from the U.S. government agencies? <clears throat> there's always been consultation. Um, if uh, there's videos and research that you know people can do or look up, where um, our tribal leaders, our chairmen, our chair chairwomen. Um, have gone to uh, Washington, D.C. to lobby. Um, they've spoken, you know, why and how we would be impacted by the border wall and by border policies. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the, the best things that have come out of the tribal consultation um, previous to the border wall is, um, in the first place, not erecting a border wall, but, but um, having in place vehicle barriers. Um, on the Dawn of the Nation <clears throat> that allowed the wildlife to go back and forth because um, the, there's several um, species that travel uh, back and forth across the line along these mountain ranges um, and then big ones like bears and jaguars that we've seen recently come back home or come back to our areas. And so <clears throat> that's something that I think, you know, we, we should and we can be proud of. Um, but that's also in danger. It's kind of up in the air um, because construction did stop uh, when President Biden got into office. But again, it stopped right on both sides of us. So we literally are in the middle. And who's to say um, what, how that's going to continue? But the people are there. The people are speaking. And it's not just the tribe, but also, you know, activists and community members who have um, literally put their bodies on the line to stop construction. Um, and not just that, but the ceremonies, the elders who don't ask for permission to cross and don't ask for permission to um, do certain things, but just do it because yeah. that's what we've always done. And that's the yeah. powerful thing, honestly. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. These, are, these are our homelands. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you. That was excellent. You're Thank welcome. you for writing. Um, all of the information, I know it's very, it's, it's a lot, right? And it's very personal. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I want to go ahead and, and, and jump to Vanessa now and talk about Oak Flat and the efforts that are going on there in her community. So um, Vanessa, please explain where Oak Flat is uh, and why it's significant to the Apache peoples and how it is under threat, threat currently. Thank you. Uh, I here for allowing me to be here. Thank you. Um, well, Oak Flat um, sits about five miles uh, east of uh, Superior, Arizona, and it's about 45 to 50 miles west of the St. Cross Apache Reservation. So as you know, with history and the, how the U.S. government has always dealt with the indigenous people, and exiling us away from our homelands and our holy site. You know, that's what exactly happened with the St. Carlos Apache tribe was, um, St. Carlos is very unique. You know, we have uh, several different um, types of Apache that live here on the reservation. And when the government grouped us all together, they placed, the here, placed us here at St. Carlos, which was called Hell's 40 Acres to the US government because there was no means to survive here. And so we were placed on the, um, a concentration camp and became our reservation. Um, so Oak Flat sits outside of our jurisdiction within the government, you know, where they placed us as prisoners of war. And so, like I said, it's about 45 to 50 miles west of the reservation. Um, why it's that threat? It's our holy site. You know, it is um, where we believe that we have direct connection to Yosin, to the creator, where we grow and are taught our, our ways, our religion. 
where we pick our medicine, where we pick our acorn, where our girls and our boys have their coming of age ceremonies. This is all tied to Oak And as it being a threat by a foreign mining company that wants to come in and do the biggest copper mine in North America, that puts my people, my religion and my identity at stake because the way this copper mine is wanting to operate, it's a blockade mine, meaning that they're gonna drill 7,000 deep into the earth, blast it, push out the copper ore, and eventually it'll subside. So all our, our, our medicine, our food of survival, our shelter, the spirit which Yulsen, which the creator has given us as Apache people, is there. You know, when, when you go there and you be able to breathe the air and experience the actual spirit, you'll feel that connection of what's important and why we want to protect it and protect it for all people. You know, and Oak Flat is very unique. It holds a lot of sacredness to a lot of tribes. You know, the Atom being people being one of them. And that's how I got to know Amy, was these holy places call on us. These holy places connect us. And so we're, as indigenous people, at the forefront. As an Apache Stronghold member, I'm at the forefront to preserve and to protect our religion, all religion. And that's the thing that when indigenous people are at the forefront, we're standing there protecting our way of life and everyone else's way of life because no one's able to survive. No one's able to be live without clean water, clean air. You know, what, what kind of world are we gonna leave our future generations? So that's why we're standing there in a religious movement, fighting a foreign mining company and fighting the US government, the Tonto National Forest on their negligence and trust responsibility that they have to indigenous people. And so when you look at us and you hear Amy talk about the border wall, you hear all of our issues, you know, we're there because our religion, our way of life is at stake. And we're indigenous to this land. I worry about my future generation. I worry about, I have an 11 month old daughter. What kind of world are we gonna live her? You know, will she be able to continue the fight? Or will we actually have laws what, like what Oak Flat is doing? Oak Flat is not only gonna protect our land and our Apache way of life, but it will set the presence for all the fights. And so will my daughter have laws that are implemented to actually let her be free, to let her pray at her holy sites? Or will it be stripped from her? And she will have nothing to tie her religion or her identity to. That's the fight that we're in. When you talk about Oak Flat, you talk about the border wall, you talk about all these indigenous fights, when you look at the root of it, we're fighting so that we can survive. We're fighting so that our future generations have the right to believe in the way of life that God, creator Yulsen has gifted them from time immemorial. So that's, that's the issue with Old Flat. You know, we're fighting a foreign mining company. We're standing strong. We're, we're making moves. We're lobbying to have the Save Old Flat Act um, pass, you know, we wanting our Congress people throughout the so-called United States to support the Save Oak Flat, because I said, it's gonna set their presence to all the indigenous fights, because they're gonna have to acknowledge the indigenous religion that we do exist and that we're not people of the past. So, you know, it's good to see here and to hear each and every one of you and to know that we're all in this together, our spirit, our prayers, who we are as indigenous people and as indigenous women come together. I'm a mother of four girls. My responsibility is to pass on the teachings that have been given to me from my father, my mother, from my grandmother and all those before us. And that's what ties me to Oak Flat. So I take my daughter there. I'm there all the time. And I just came back yesterday 
and I let her walk barefoot to feel Mother Earth so that she is acknowledged by it. Because my fear is what if it's gone? You know, and I pray that it isn't. I pray that we all come together and that, you know, it's going to take all of us, all of us to unify, to make actual change, to implement actual laws to protect our way of life. Thank you, Vanessa. Absolutely powerful. Thank you. And you're, you're so, you're so right on with all of that. I mean, Indigenous women, that's where it's at. I mean, we're really taking the charge here and, you know, we're, we're making our mark on the ground. This is native land, you know, and I'll keep saying it until I go back to the stars with the ancestors. But you know, for every Native person, we are the land. We are the land. So we can't tease ourselves apart from this. You know, this is who we are. This is where we've been since the beginning of time through our cosmologies. This is what our medicine tells us through our ceremonies and our languages. And so we have a very deep rooted connection here and um, it will never be teased apart. You know, it, you know, colonization and all of this has tried, but we're still here and we will not be erased. And I think this is the message that us Native women will continue to put out there um, because this, again, we, we are mothers. We have future generations that we want to bring here and our children deserve to know the land. They deserve to have access to these sacred spaces. They deserve to know who they are and to have their cultural identity um, celebrated. So thank you, Vanessa, that was absolutely powerful. And, and very just inspiring, thank you. <clears throat> I wanna go ahead and um, switch over to Terry now and ask Terry to please explain and talk about um, some of the uranium mining that has occurred in uh, Navajo land, but also to please talk about um, the organization that she's with, the Redwater Pond Road Community Association, and also um, to talk about the 1979 Church Rock spill which is the largest spill to date of radioactive waste in US history. So thank you, Terry. Uh, thank you. Um, like Tanya said, my name is Terry. Um, so in 1979, uh, the spill occurred in the early hours of a Monday morning and there was a 20 foot breach that had failed. It was an earthen dam and it failed spilling out 94 million gallons of toxic mill waste, which had the acidity of uh, battery acid, basically the pH balance of battery acid. And this, all this waste went into the Perco River and the waste continued to flow all the way down into Arizona and into the little Colorado. And because of the pH balance in, in that waste, individuals who actually went into the Arroyo um, suffered uh, a lot of just health issues and chronic health issues and even um, fatal issues. And these individuals, they waded through the mill waste to get to the livestock that was stranded on the other side of the Arroyo and they suffered uh, severe chemical burns uh, resulting in amputations, in some cases, cancers, uh, respiratory illnesses, reproductive issues, um, autoimmune issues. Uh, these are the conditions that these communities that have any uranium issues plaguing them. For our community, in the communities that are neighboring to the Rio Perco have all been affected, but um, many people don't even know about what had happened because this whole thing happened on indigenous land. And for a lot of, a lot of our allies and ourselves, we just feel like we're expendable to the United States government. And so, with these um, issues, um, a lot of it is not just uranium issues. It's um, different extractive 
um, companies that are coming into these communities because there's nobody there to advocate for them because a lot of people don't know, understand, or realize what's actually happening. And so with the current uranium issue, uh, these are in predominantly indigenous communities and the issues that they have are in the groundwater, the soil, the air, the vegetation. And these issues have emotional, physical, historical, and cultural traumas tied to them. And our Dene have not been able to just gather herbs and the traditional materials to protect, just practice our own traditional ways, our own culture, our ways of Hajon. And so with, with what we want in our community is just to have it clean up, but at the same time, we want it to be done responsibly. And so um, we just want people to understand and educate themselves on these issues. And if you don't know how to educate yourself on, you know, just becoming a scientist yourself, and <laughs> it's kind of just what um, a lot of the community members have had to do. And um, we've had um, social impacts that have come about on us. Um, this is kind of like a type of alienation and isolation by fear of that health issues that we combat every day. People don't know or have that have educated themselves on what's going on with us sometimes. And then with COVID and our community members already having respiratory issues due to uranium contamination getting into their lungs, it's it was it's very hard for some of the these community members just to even cough and so it was it was kind of scary there for all last year just because of covid and so it has further impacted a lot of the community members in that way um, the environmental impact is that constant radiation contamination that bombards the community. And they've endured this contamination, this radiation for 70 plus years. And the, it, it just, it not only just that environmental impact, it, it furthers into the actual culture of our, of our native ways and it went into our cultural practices on how that environmental impact has impacted us, not in just that one way, but it's been in multiple ways where we've had to, you know, endure different ways and endure different times. And sometimes it feels like we're living in third world country status is just because a lot of our indigenous communities are treated poorly and just treated as expendable people, which is not fair. And when it came to the uranium spill and the uranium contamination, it continues to impact us still to this day. Uh, it's impacted our economy, our own own cultural economy because a lot of our cultural ways was our livestock and our traditional arts and crafts and the communities. A lot of these communities have relied on that for uh, monetary relief. And so with the strain on the communities already, because now they have to buy and haul water, they have to buy and haul wood, they have to travel to quote unquote clean locations for traditional herbs and material. These, this has all been a strain just because, you know, these different industries decided that they wanted more money. They wanted to line their pockets more and more while the indigenous communities have just continued to suffer more and more and, you know, you hear all these different people saying, why don't you move out? Why don't you do this? And that's the thing about 
for us as the Dene, we have a cultural tie to the land and also a physical tie. It's not just, just like, oh yeah, that's home. For us, um, we lose our umbilical cord and we bury it near home. And so we constantly yearn to go back home. And so for, for people who are in these impacted communities with uranium issues and they're moved out, it's a constant yearning of wanting to just go back home. And so that's how it's been for myself and my children. And so is these are things that have been plaguing our communities and it's been it's been rough but we continue to move forward and um a question that talia had just wrote to me was just how that land management and the bureaucracy has been and it's it's been a negative impact uh, the misusing of funding and no transparency with the impacted communities from the land management. And then on top of that, not having uh, an actual proper plan for cleanup of uranium contamination of the different sites and Superfund sites. Um, our community is actually one of the first um, to actually go through something like this as a super fun site. And it's on, it's on the Navajo reservation and we border five different chapters. We border two different regions of the EPA. So it's been uh, a lot of bureaucracy that, that we've had to go through. And so um, the bureaucracy impacts has just been frustrating for the community because we've had to learn how to go through these different channels of the many different governments and offices and officials. You know, there's different ways of getting meetings set up for one type of government. And then you go to a different one and it's a totally different process. And so our communities had to learn how to do a lot of this. This is this is like lawyer stuff. And you know, we we're not lawyers and we're not we're not chemists, we're not archaeologists, we're not geologists, we're not hydrologists, but because of us and our knowledge of land and everything like that, we we're experts in our own way. And so this has been the struggle that the community has had to have, but has overcome because we do want a clean land for ourselves, our elders, our children, our grandchildren. And so, um, the current efforts that my community is doing and other allies that we do know, it's um, right now it's due to COVID, we're not able to be very active, but for the Redwater Pond Road community, we have been dealing with the draft environmental impact statement of a 1.1 million cubic yard uh, cleanup of the mine and that seems very daunting but at the same time again the process has been halted by the Navajo Nation president due to the lack of communication and this is the lack of communication with the Navajo Nation government and the community. And that's another example of the bureaucracy issues that we have to deal with. And that has been like one of the hardest things that we've been dealing with is everybody else sees this as an opportunity to further their careers and for our community, it, we don't see it as furthering our careers. I mean, I probably could go go to school and get a lot of my credits done 
by just a lot of the community efforts that I've done now, but it's not something I want to do right now because there are so many things that I want to continue doing for the communities. And it's just not my community, it's other communities. We have we have knowledge that we've learned and just it's just been packed away inside our brains for so many years that we can help other communities clean up. We can help them learn how to get past some of these different government issues that they deal with. And so it's been it's been a learning process, but for the community that I come from, we've decided that we were just going to not take no for an answer. And we've decided that we're going to have our own nonprofit organization and be heard and continue to have our voices heard. And that's something that a lot of our other communities have started doing. And, you know, these government officials have actually started to listen to them because of that and so sometimes you have to play dirty just like they do and um, make your own organization and make it to the point where these guys can who make all these laws can understand laws can be rewritten laws can be changed they do it all the time for their colonizer friends so this is <laughs> I don't want to, I didn't want to say that, but you know, it's true. And so this is just kind of how, um, how I've been treating this whole issue. I've been treating it as not just a community issue, but, you know, a, a whole world issue. And so this is how our community has been just trying to continue to educate and continue to be there for other communities as well and so this is how our I believe that you know we should be doing things this way as well too so um, with uranium issues uh, we continue to work with other allies we continue to work with Talia we continue to work with New Mexico Environmental Law Center we work with MACE who is a multicultural alliance for safe environment um, they have other other impacted communities along the Grants Mineral Belt and so that's how we continue to just be our our own just our own advocates and so this is I'm hoping that this is basically what you guys all want to hear <laughs> so this is I think I believe this is it for me thank you Amazing. Thank you so much, Gary. That's a lot to condense and put into, you know, a short amount of time. And I, I yeah, thank you. Um, yep. There's so much, so much to cover there. Yeah, you know, because I, I also worked on nuclear issues and uranium issues. And so I could talk about this all day. But yeah, <laughs> you know, nuclear issues are everybody's issues. I mean, we need to talk about it like that, too. You know, the whole nuclear fuel chain impacts all of us. I yes. mean, the transportation routes that they cross are across the country, all over I-40, all these major railways, major freeways, um, you know, none of our communities, which mostly pass through rural communities, none of our communities are, um, you know, prepared for any kind of radioactive disaster. And that's something that we've continually put on the table over and over. Um, and Navajo Nation, we have a moratorium on uranium mining, right? And so do our, our neighbors of the Pueblo of Laguna. They also have a moratorium on uranium mining. And so we've worked for years to organize and push on even local decision makers on a county level to start um, because we knew they were leaving the door open for the companies to come back in. Um, you know, and we were like, oh, heck no, we're going to we're going to start lobbying our local county commissioners. We're going to start presenting to them and, you know, do a petition. And, you know, we really had to push back. But something I also wanted to talk about was, um, you know, the cultural significance and um, how our sacred spaces are being impacted by not only extractive industries, but just, um, you know, uh, people just being completely obliv oblivious on how to visit these spaces. And so, um, you know, the extraction of 
uranium mining on Mount Taylor, for instance, which is a sacred mountain to um, not just Navajo, but over 20 tribes in both uh, Arizona and, and New Mexico, um, you know, it has a significant impact on the psyche of native peoples too, because when our sacred spaces are desecrated, then that has, um, it hinders our ability to heal ourselves, right? And so this is why you see a lot of um, disparities within our communities, everything from uh, domestic violence, substance abuse, diabetes, you know, we have all of these things that exist within our communities, but it's the fact that our land is being desecrated and our sacred spaces are being desecrated on a daily basis. And this, this breaks down that uh, our capability to even heal um, from the land. And like I said earlier, we are the land. And so um, this is important for people to know is that this is how connected we are to our land. And um, again, you know, our traditional knowledge exceeds any kind of land management practices as far as I'm concerned, which is why we need to be at the table. We need to be a part of all of this. We need to give consent and we need to, we need to share our, our knowledge on how our practices have kept our land um, pristine for so long, right? And so thank you so much for sharing that. That's a lot to unpack and a lot to cover and, and nuclear issues are, you know, they're heavy issues. So. Um, it's a lot of jargon, a lot of technical information to translate for folks. So thank you, Terry, for all that amazing work that you've done and, and all the amazing people at uh, Redwater Pond Road and the Multicultural Alliance for Safe Environment. Um, yes, thank you everybody for all your great work. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into, did we lose Vanessa? Oh dear, okay, so I think Vanessa had to jump off. We may have lost connection. But let's go ahead and jump into another question. Um, and this one is for both panelists. And this is, uh, let's see, what is your definition of tribal consultation and what changes are needed to better serve tribes? And that's a big question, so. Vanessa's back. Hey, Vanessa. Okay, cool. So I just threw the fourth question out on the table. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, we're having a storm going on right now. So oh, my okay. electricity and everything went out. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Um, we can troubleshoot that. So let me go ahead and repeat the question since Vanessa. Hi. Hi, baby. <laughs> I'll go ahead and repeat the question. Um, since you just jumped back on. So uh, the question was, what is tribal consultation? Uh, what is your definition of tribal consultation and what changes are needed to better serve tribes? And so we can do, um, you ladies can go around and we can, why don't we start with Amy? Thanks, Amy. Thank you. Hmm. Well, when I think about consultation, I actually think about your, um, your Facebook background. <laughs> that says consultation is not consent. Um, and, I, and I think about that because, you know, there are several conversations that we've had with all of these different agencies that um, in the past hadn't really resulted in, in much. But um, I, do, I do have to say that it, it, it is changing and I think it is, it is because of what Terry um, had shared, you know, that we are our own advocates. And a lot of times um, that piece, that really important piece of culture and like, and passion and, and prayer is something that's missing in all of the technical jargon. And sometimes from what I've seen, that's what really um, touches people, you know, because in the end, like we're all human. And then a lot of times when I've had to deal with border patrol agents and, um, you know, just, just trying to be uh, intimidating. Um, you know, I've had to put on that, 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 that hat, you know, to, to use um, language, but also just to be on them and to really assert that this is who I am, this is my homeland, and, and to, you know, just really spend that time um, uh, connecting with someone in that way. But as far as consultation, it definitely um, needs respect free and prior informed consent, um, and also just like listening, but also really taking action um, on, on things that are actually gonna benefit the people. 
Um, and I've seen that in, in certain spaces. And I think one of the um, most um, encouraging things that has happened this past year was um, getting to know, um, as far as consultation and our own people and having people in those places that can actually help um, our, our causes is uh, meeting um, Ms. Dorothy Fire, uh, Firecloud, who's the National Park uh, Tribal Liaison. She came out to um, the Arawaipi Orquito Piquito Springs a couple of months ago to see for herself um, the impacts that have happened on the land and to the people. And so that's a, that's a work in progress, but it is progress. It's more progress that we've made in the last couple of years um, by having um, someone who's, who's indigenous and someone who has um, that type of position to actually um, move things forward. So um, I've seen you know, some, some change and some, some good things happen in that way. Um, but it is work. It is a lot of work. And Terry's right. You know, we're we're not um, where we don't have those degrees and those titles, but we we do in some senses. You know, because we do that work every day, um, especially to be lawyers and to know the laws and to know all of those things. So, um, I think getting the people that have all of that knowledge to be a part of that process is very very key. Um, so that's where these relationships come in, like um, like um, Vanessa had mentioned earlier, you know, how we met. And, and so just to know that we all know each other and we um, can depend on each other to, to do this work of protecting our, our people and our, our homes is, is also, like, I think, a big part of that, too. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's amazing. Um, and doing the work for so long over these years, you know, I see a lot of women and I, I rarely, I see hardly any of our, our men and it really kind of speaks to it too. Right. Um, but I, I put it out there to our, our native men, like we need you, right. Be here, step up. Like we need you here with us in these spaces. Um, we need, we need our warriors right beside us. And so, this is my call out to all native men to, yeah, come on, let's do this. We, you know, we gotta, we gotta stand our ground as native peoples. Um, and it's really about that healing too. And I really like what you ladies said, as far as like, you know, I think us natives, we're all kind of um, Indian law experts in our own degree. And we kind of have to be, and we're all kind of like citizen science scientists in our own way as well, right? Because we have to self-educate ourselves in all of these very technical, very, um, yeah, law, legal things. And it's hard, but, um, but we do it, right? And it, it needs to be done. Like I said, it's necessary. So amazing. Thank you for, for highlighting some of those points for us, Amy. Um, Terry or Vanessa, would you like to uh, add on to that? Uh, I would, um, you know, um, as uh, I guess, uh, besides being on the front line and, and doing the work as a Apache Stronghold member and uh, fighting to protect Oak Flat, um, I also work for the Historic Preservation and Archaeology Department for my tribe. So consultation is very important. Tribal consultation is needed and is in place there for a reason. But I sit at the table and listen to these tribal consultations and these mitigations and, you know, all these words that they use. And the, consult the tribal consultation that's set in place, those that are on the other side of the table need to actually have meaning meaningful consultation. You know, they need to be there and tell the truth. They need to sit there and actually want to admit and acknowledge the indigenous people. That's only how true consultation is gonna work for our people. Is if, you know, um, don't make it just a check mark on the list and say, okay, we talk to these tribes, you know? Um, and that's the, the harsh reality about tribal consultation is it can be good. But the people that initiate it, the people that are trying to um, say, oh, we acknowledge you, it's more than that. You know, they have to be truthful and honest and actually put in the work in order to make tribal consultation work. 
you know, and, and I was like, like Amy said, you know, we do see it helping. We, you know, it's in place for a reason. But, you know, like I said, it, it's going to need the, the, the people on the other side, like Tonto National Forest, when I'm sitting there in these tribal consultation meetings, and I'm looking at them, and I'm like, you know, no, this is not just to mark us all off the list. You know, when are you actually going to take your trust responsibility that's in place and actually um, do it, you know, and instead of lying and um, choosing um, profit and greed over protecting our natural resources, over uh, protecting our way of life in order to protect in our, our religion and our environment. Just like Terry had stated, you know, it goes hand in hand. When you talk with, talked about indigenous people and their way of life, you can't separate the environment from our way of life. Our tools, our ceremonial tools, our medicine come from Mother Earth. So when there's a destruction on her, that's a destruction and a genocide on her religion, our, our way of life. Because we are Mother Earth, we are, we come from her, you know, all our elements that we talk about is entwined with her. And so when that tribal consultation is at the table, it has to be truthful in order for Indigenous people for it to work. You know, we've been lied to for over 500 years. And if the government continues to do it, there's no way it's going to have, it's going to work on our side. So we need to put those right people in those situations, in those in those offices, and to make those moral decisions based on our people. In order for Biden's administration, order for the the his, uh, the the Park Service, for the um, the USDA and National Forest Service, in order for it to really work, we need those right people in those in those positions. So that's just my thought on tribal consultation. It can be great, but they got to start telling the truth and actually uh, commit to it. Absolutely. And I, you, you know, you hit on a lot of really great points. And I, what I've heard from some land managers is um, I think they don't, they just don't know how to approach tribes sometimes. And I think that really goes back to them not doing their homework as far as, um, you, you know, who these tribes are, um, their their culture, their language, um, even the traditional homelands of these tribes, um, you know, they don't they don't do their homework as far as, you know, what what uh, interests, what tribal interests exist within each of these tribes that they're trying to engage. And so what they do is, you know, they send a, 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 a short letter or they put, uh, they give you one call and that's it if nobody answers, so what, right? or they'll put a little ad in the paper uh, that nobody can see really. <laughs> and that's really their, their little checkbox. Okay, we check the box, this is consultation. We put the word out, but that's not enough, right? What we need no. is we need, we need trust building. We need relationship building. We need to build, they need to build that rapport with tribes, right? And tribal communities. Um, and they need to do their homework as far as learning about each tribe. We are unique in our own way. We all have our own languages. We all have our own ways of knowing. We all have our own significant connections to this land. And so for those reasons, we have to, that, that rapport has to be built. It has to be built. And the homework on land managers needs to be done. They need to understand that they need to do their homework when it comes to understanding tribal interests and tribal territories. Um, traditional tribal territories, right? And so thank you for, for touching on that. Um, Terry, would you like to add anything there? Oh, you're yeah. on mute. Yeah, yeah, I can. <laughs> um, like communication and collaboration with these different government um, entities and having, um, our community sciences and expertise treated as known knowledge and not only, it's not only gonna just help ourselves, but it'll help all these different uh, governments like the US EPA, Navajo Nation EPA, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and you know any of these different parties that are preparing to do anything for these different communities. Um, in my case, it's preparing for a uranium cleanup. 
and just holding these the governments all the governments accountable and keeping our community members within those decision making processes is a lot of what i believe that that tribal consultation is it's not for it's not just for us it's for all of us it's for them and for us and just keeping just keeping everybody honest basically because so many times a lot of our indigenous communities have been lied to for so many years and just having somebody part of your community there sitting at a table with all these different I like to call them nerds because I've been in so many of those meetings and it's like a bunch of nerds they're talking about you know geology hydrology anything and everything and sometimes it goes over your head but you know just using your own self as a consultant as well and writing down things that you don't know um, and then later on looking it up and basically becoming more of an expert not only for yourself but your community and so that's that's a lot of um how i think of uh the tribal consultation and you know ways that we can um be better at it and to later serve more more community members other community members and other indigenous communities and not just our own um our own tribe but to be able to communicate and collaborate with other indigenous communities because uranium issues are not just a navajo problem border borders are not just Amy's problem, you know, there's all these different things that we have to look at as a whole. It's not just, it's just not just their problem. It's all of our problems because we are all connected. We all have five fingers. That's how the creator has made us. And so as indigenous people, we're, we're tied to each other. We're not different. We're, we're one. And so that's how I, I like to continue keeping that that open mindedness and being uh, having that broad mind and prospect of everything just to not be narrow minded, but to just be able to accept and just kind of just go with the flow sometimes because that's the only way we can really get work done sometimes, especially when you're working with other other consultants. Thank you. Amy, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I just wanted to share that um, I had this cool picture that I that I wanted to share earlier and I think it was a good representation of consultation. Um, there was an instance where um, Border Patrol had made a mountaintop surveillance site uh, without permission and so the community um, had them shut it down and you know they agreed that they would um, remediate the land and um, when the community members went to go check up on it um, basically all they did was throw dead branches on the road and say okay you know we we fixed <laughs> we we fixed yeah right there so it's it's true you know like what what Terry and Vanessa like we're all saying it's it's it needs to be honest and it needs to be um, true. You know, it, it needs to have some some fully back action behind it and not just to throw some branches on the road. So that this is, you know, their idea of, of um, restoration, you know, of, of a land that they cleared without permission, um, that they agreed that they wouldn't um, do in the first place. Um, and because, you know, not a lot of people are out there on that mountain because it has significance, cultural significance, you know, nobody's going to go bother it. So, you know, it was just an instance where um, the community member had went up there to check on it. And this is an agency that has billions of dollars um, and promises these things, but this is what it actually looks like. So I thought it was kind of, kind of funny. 
Yeah, and, that's, that's appalling. Yeah. That is appalling. And sadly, yeah. <laughs> this is what's happening across the board. I mean, it's I heard- so appalling people, is funny, you know? And yeah, it's- Not um, funny, but it is. It's ridiculous. Yeah. No, one of um, our uh, um, Shivwitz Pai relatives um, was talking about how Harlan Featherhat was talking about how um, up in his territory, in his homelands, they do the same thing, basically. You know, that's their their bogus remediation, um, mm -hmm. but it's not, it's not good enough. Mm -hmm. Do you want to add something, Vanessa? Yeah, really quick. It kind of goes along with what Amy showed us, you know, is uh, their form of... Um, their trust responsibility or their tribal consultation is all is also of a trickery, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Like with the Tonto, Na Tonto National Forest Service, they put an indigenous person as a tribal liaison, and, and just to say, look, we're including your indigenous people. But yet, you know, it's sad to say is that you know she she's not with us, you know. She she doesn't have the mindset of an indigenous person, you know, um, she wasn't raised that way, you know? And so, but that's their form of an example of like, hey, look, we, we're we listening. We put an indigenous person in there to be a tribal liaison. And you're like, wait a minute, you know, just because she's indigenous, not necessarily goes in our favor either, you know, because of, of assimilation because of being exiled, you know, and that's the harsh reality is that indigenous people face so many traumas and so much in different forms, you know, but because the forest service is like, well, here, let, you know, we have this, this indigenous person in there. And they're also creating programs using funding from like Resolution Copper and telling the people we are doing consultation. We are working with the tribes. And, and that's a complete lie. You know, they have their tribal monitoring program and I feel really bad. It could be a great program, but why use resolution copper money? Mm. You know, you, you know, and, and then they put these, our indigenous people in these areas to say, okay, go and survey it. Um, find your cultural significance. You know, you work along with these archeology span archeologists and yet they're going to be the ones to have to pick which site to, de to, to destroy. You know, that's the government placing trauma on our people, mm -hmm. you know, because they're in there thinking they are going to make change. But you can't make change when you're using uh, foreign mining companies money that's going to destroy old flat, you know. Yeah. And, um, and so that's a form like what we're all saying is that... Um, we have to then, and I and why I wanted to express that is because you know we have our non-native uh, indigenous people that are listening and watching, and they're saying, "Well, look what you know." You read in the in the media, like, "Oh, well, Resolution Copper is." They are saying that they're, and the Tonto National Forest is saying they are working with tribes, mm -hmm. but that's not the case. You know, yeah. um, it, it's not with the people that are fighting for it. It's not with the actual tribe. They're just using people. That's, you yeah, know, straight up tokenizing, tokenizing yeah. Native peoples for Definitely. their own agenda, right? And that, yes. that sadly is very rampant as well. So, you know, again, they should be working with the people that are impacted from those communities as opposed to bringing in some, some Native that has no clue yeah. <laughs> and is not yeah. invested, right, in that, in that community like, like, like you all are. So that's important. Um, yeah, and I, I liked how you talked about how these companies use their their money too, right, to do some of these things. Same with um, some of these um, studies that they do, and, and Terry knows what I'm talking about because a lot of these uranium companies do the same crap, where um, they pay for these studies, but the, the, the entity paying for it is actually the mining company, right? And they're saying, oh, here's all this great stuff, and we're not impacting any cultural landscapes. Um, this is what ha this is how um, uh, perfect it is. When in reality, it's 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 bogus, right? I mean, they're just kind of telling telling whoever what they want to hear. But um, this is these are the ugly uh, things that go on <laughs> behind the scenes within our communities, and we see it firsthand because we're doing the work. But you know, we don't hear about it often because um, again, we we. We don't have a lot of spaces to share our perspectives. And so this is why I thought it was important to bring us all together to have space and time to do this. Um, 
So absolutely, thank you for breaking up those great points. Um, and let's see, where where were we here? <laughs> I, I lost track of uh, where we were at. And um, Terry, did you wanna add anything before we move on to the next question? Okay, okay, awesome. All right, so let's see, quick time check. We have about nine minutes. So let's see if we can get to one more question. We have two, but let's see if we can get to one. Um, and here we go. Well, I think this one's important. Let's get this out of the way. What actions can people take to support your communities? Um, if you have any um, uh, donation, what links that you all want to put in the chat um, from your communities, feel free to do that. Um, your websites are already in the chat. So folks, if you want to learn more about um, all the great work these women are doing, please tap into those links. Um, check out the great work they're doing, donate to their organizations, donate to their communities. Um, and this is what is gonna keep the work going. So just, yeah, real quickly, what actions can people take to um, support your communities and the work that you're doing? And Terry, why don't we go ahead and start with you? Um, I think for just actions, I don't really, um, I appreciate, you know, monetary don donations and such, but um, for me, mostly it's like to speak up for our elders and our youth, um, give a voice to the voiceless and listen to the community and not the news. Um, the news can put whatever they want, but actually talk and find out what the community is really going through. And um just for all of us to just stand with our ancestors and continue to bring our mother earth back to Hojon, which is balance, um, bringing everything back to a balance. And um, that's basically it for me. That's, uh, that's what I want. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Terry. Mm -hmm. um, Vanessa or Amy, one of you, would you like to go next? And again, what actions can people take to support your work and in, in your communities? I can go. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I I agree with Terry. You know, it's 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 um it does get complicated because they know that people when they want to take action, they want to come out and they want to see and they want to be there and they want to be a part of it, but. Um, especially now, you know, we need to do our part to keep our community safe. But I think through um, platforms like this, thank you, Talia, so much. Um, it's good to listen, you know, and to really, really listen and understand. Because I think that's also another thing is that a lot of times people hear things, but they're not really listening. But to really listen to each of our perspectives and to see what are common messages are which is you know this is this is what we want we want our communities to be safe and we want our people to be safe and i think that's what everybody wants across the board um <clears throat> and for people who are non-indigenous or you know don't come from our communities <clears throat> there is a way for you to advocate on behalf of these places um, and like terry said it's not just my issue or your issue it affects everybody um, but there, is, there are ways to advocate it in spaces um, and to people that we don't have access to. Uh, we're not, you know, in universities every day. We're not in, in governments or what have you. And so there's, there's ways to carry these messages across um, to all of those different spaces. And if you do um, have access to places where you can help, if you're, you know, in a position to, I encourage that too, because I do have some... Um, and I'm sure we all do have non-Indigenous friends and allies who um, really do the best that they can in their positions to, to help us. And so, um, you know, I appreciate that work in, in that way and who also do it without um, being a, a white savior or to uh, make it their own cause, you know, but to do it on behalf of everybody and with respect, you know, that's that's what I respect, you know, and, and what I see is when people actually put in the work. Um, and so that's something I appreciate seeing uh, more of. So, thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think you kind of answered the question that uh, we had in the Q&A about what non-Native um, 
folks can do to um, help elevate the importance of honest, authentic tribal communication and free prior informed consent. And so, yeah, like Amy said, we don't have access to a lot of these spaces um, like y'all do, right? So it's really important to start building that dialogue within those spaces that, um, that don't know, right? That don't know and haven't heard these perspectives. And so that's um, a part of being a good ally, I think, and really stepping up and um, stepping into your bravery. And it's really about calling out white supremacy in so many ways. I mean, this is what it is, right? And and let's be real, it is. It's, it's calling out white supremacy. And that's what needs to happen um, to do this work and for real healing to happen. And so I just wanted to share that real quick. But um, Vanessa, would you mind sharing with us uh, what folks can do to support your communities and your work? Well, first and foremost, I think, you know, we've all kind of touched on it is educating yourself, you know, um, not just within our own communities and but our, our indigenous brothers and sisters and our allies, those that are non-natives that are living around us because our issue is at your front door. Our issue is right in your face. And when we're all out there fighting for our causes, we're fighting to protect you as well, you know, those uh, non-Indigenous people. Um, because like we've all said, the environment is um, at risk and we as Indigenous people cannot separate ourselves from it. And so we're at the forefront, you know, we're fighting for everyone so that those future, ge future generations um, have the right to drink clean water have the right to have water. I mean, with Resolution Copper, you know, there's a big issue with the water's usage. You know, what's going to happen to Arizona? We're already in a drought. And so um, we're going to lose that. So that's one thing is, you know, educate yourselves on these issues because we're fighting for everyone. You know, it's just not the indigenous community. But also, you know, we need actual laws implemented to protect our way of life. You know, we, we, we only have... Um, recommendations and um, and just acknowledgement. We need actual laws to protect our religion and our and our, our holy places and um, our way of life. So, you know, it's, it's reaching out to your Congress people, reach out to your senators, you know, like for my fight, you know, um, everybody call, call your senators, call your Congress people, tell them to support the, Oplat, the Save Oak Platte Act, you know, um, because we're not gonna win until there's gonna, and what's sad, I guess the, the harsh reality is that the world we live in, we need these laws in place, you know, and um, for us, for our survival, for our religion to survive, our way of life. And so it's, you know, actually making those, those changes and um, no matter who you are, you know, call and tell them to take the border wall down, you know, call and tell them to, to um, listen to Terry's fight, call and tell them to say, well, fight. I mean, it's where we, we know we have the vote. We put them in office. We, we've proven that this last election. So, you know, we, we need to um, continue to stick together. And those that are our allies that are non-native, you know, is um, it's a part of healing. You guys got to hear the truth on how America was founded. And because not only were the indigenous people who were lied to, but so were you. And in order to make change for a better future, you have to acknowledge what happened to us. You know, that's the one way to start the fight, to start, to start um, fighting with us. Because we know you no one's going away, but we need to heal. So, you know, I really encourage that. Reach out to your Congress people and and acknowledge what happened to the indigenous people. That's the way we're gonna move forward. Absolutely, thank you so much, Vanessa. Wow, that was powerful. Um, and I see that too, you know, I think white, white America is traumatized too. I mean, there's so <laughs> much healing that needs to happen within white America, you know, it's, I think that's that's a whole nother conversation that needs to be had. But um, the, when when white folks realize that that trauma exists within themselves as well, um, I think that's when we can all, you know, that's when real healing can really start happening too. Terry, do you want to go ahead and add something real quick? Um, I just wanted to go back to the fact that you pointed out that we're all women here. 
<laughs> and I just want to show you guys my cup. That was a gift from one of our our um, all, one of our colonizer friends <laughs> with Mace. Her name is Susan Gordon, and she gifted me this cup. And it says, "A woman's place is in the resistance." Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> I was like, "I love that cup," and it's true. And the reason why all of us women are here is because we have that um, motherly instinct. Um, it is in our blood to help. It's in our blood to be there. And just as we say, Mother Earth, she's our mother. And we're not going to leave her behind. We're going to help her. And that's, I think that's one of the biggest reasons why we're basically a bunch of indigenous women. And I really appreciate that. So thanks. Oh, thank you, Terry. That was really sweet. And yes, yeah, Susan is a great ally. I love Susan. And um, that's a really cool cup that she gifted you. And so we are at the end of our session, folks. And I really want to express my deepest gratitude for all of you wonderful, amazing women here doing extraordinary work. Holy cow. I mean, this isn't for the lighthearted or the thin skinned, right? I mean, you got to have a lot of um, ten tenacity to really do the work. And so uh, bravo to all of you. And um, thank you everybody for tuning in this evening. We have another session next Wednesday, six to 7.30. Uh, we will be talking about rights of nature um, and climate justice. And we have um, Joe T Tenorino from uh, Native American Rights Fund, uh, Shannon O'Laughlin from the American Indian Association Oh, geez, I forgot the last part of it. <laughs> and, and also Dion Ben, a colleague of mine from the Grand Canyon Trust, who will be right. talking, talking about uh, rights in nature and some of the work that he's done there. And so please join us next Wednesday as we will dig into those topics. But before we end, I would like to um, share a quote. And this is um, from Mr. Russell Means. I find freedom to be the most important issue facing any human being today because without freedom, then life is pointless. The more dependent you become on centralized power, the more easily you are led around. So to the great Russell Means, thank you for laying that wisdom on us. And thank you all again for your amazing um, participation here and just for sharing time and space with us all. And, 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 and thank you. I can't say that enough. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and that's a wrap, folks. So we're going to go ahead and uh, shut it down now. And thank you. And tune in again next Wednesday. Thank I'll you, sisters. Yes, thank you. I hear a good last name.